Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Santa Cruz Queer History webinar series. We're glad you're here. The, um, this particular webinar, we've already done that. As I mentioned before, if you'd mute your device, feel free to use the chat room. And um, if you want to hang out afterwards and just talk afterwards, after we're done with the recording, you're certainly welcome to. If you've got feedback, please go to my website and share your feedback or send me an email www.robdarrow.us. So also want to announce the Santa Cruz Ma Queer Santa Cruz exhibit is now open. Um, and again, I meant to mention this earlier. My name is Rob Darrow and I'm the facilitator for the webinar. Hopefully when the pandemic is over, you'll all come to Santa Cruz and visit our exhibit in person. Um, just to give you a little background history, Santa Cruz County Queer History is set in the context of national LGBTQ history, that the national movement impacted Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz people impacted the national movement. There's a lot of back and forth. And as we've put up the LGBTQ history exhibit here in Santa Cruz, we've learned more and more from talking to people and from these webinars about how the incredible people around Santa Cruz County impacted our entire community. Uh, of course, UC Santa Cruz and Cabrillo College came in in the 60s and Santa Cruz County has always been a pretty inclusive community, which some people think that's why Lou Harrison settled here. But we'll let we'll get back to that in a little bit. So just as a context of all of this for the LGBTQ history perspective, in the 50s were the Lavender Scare where LGBTQ people were being persecuted for a variety of reasons. That gave way to a reaction by this organization called the Mattachine Society in Los Angeles, and then the Daughters of Belitis in San Francisco. Um, of course, we had Stonewall in 69, but in Santa Cruz, we had the organization called LAGMU in 1974, and the first Pride was in 1975. So our presentation today is Lou Harrison, a queer music composer, amplifies Santa Cruz culture. And we're gonna learn a lot about him from people who knew him, but just to give you a little background about him is he was originally born in Portland, Oregon. And uh, from my reading, I learned that he was composing music since the age of 10, and he interacted and learned about a variety of different music that you can see there, Gregorian chant, Baroque, percussion, Asian, uh, just intonation tuning, which I don't know what that is. I've got to listen more to find out about it. But throughout his life, he composed over 300 works in all these different genres. Um, in addition to a diversity of pieces for instruments, for dances, for all different groups of people. So a very um, flexible person in a variety of different ways and impacted the world in many ways. And in 1953, he moved to Aptos. You'll hear more about his involvement in this group called the Society for Individual Rights. He performed at our first Santa Cruz Pride in 1975, and he and his partner Bill were grand marshals of the 1995 Santa Cruz Pride Parade, and then he passed away in 2003. But we want to start by listening to some of Lou's music. So that's a cue for Roger. So that was the overture to concerto for violin, piano, and a small orchestra, and the pianist was, was Keith Jarrett. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can get to the speakers and listen to them. And um, I, I want to start by asking the first question here uh, to all of you, the, the guests here. Uh, what brought you to Santa Cruz, and how did you first connect with Lou Harrison? And I'm going to start with Tom on that one. Tom here. 
Um, I first moved to Santa Cruz because for many years I traveled up and down the coast. I'm from the LA area, beach town down south. And I would going up to um, anti-war marches and uh, things like that. And I would always use the coast to travel through and Santa Cruz was on the way. And so over the years, just after several uh, experiences in falling in love with the community, when I actually uh, uh, met a boyfriend, I traveled in Europe for a year. We uh, decided to move somewhere in the Bay Area and uh, we wound up moving to Santa Cruz in, in 1973. And I, uh, we moved to Boulder Creek, and I lived in Boulder Creek until 1980. And uh, and my life before the, I'm very engaged with new music. It's very much a part of my life. It's one of the I think one of the intersections for me uh, with Lou is that uh, it's a real natural place for me to go to musically. So uh, though it wasn't until probably. Uh, I'm not even sure the year exactly. There was a a, a 40s plus men's uh, potluck a, a group, and they they decided to invite people who were younger because there was a lot of younger people in that yet. Then, and I was amongst them, and I actually some some of the people here too. And I think there several people actually went to the uh, the potluck, uh, and that's when I first moved, moved, uh, met Lou because he was. Uh, uh, very involved with the 40s plus group. And so that was uh, just really fascinating and just meeting him and having a conversation with him. And I was studying sign language, he was studying sign language. And he actually was quite proficient at it. And he, he was also very proficient at Esperanto, which is a fascinating thing too, which I discovered in the conversation that, that day. And uh, yeah, that's sort of the very early times of uh my first time really meeting lou uh was then great roger would you share a little bit about how you ended up in santa cruz your work and how you first interacted with lou sure hi everybody thanks for inviting me um, i arrived on the scene here in 1972 with a job at the university teaching music there for a while uh, i eventually moved on to the san jose symphony where i played for 30 years and also the cabrillo festival orchestra and I moved away from Santa Cruz for a while, but I, I had to come back in 1988. I've been here ever since. But early on, I became involved with KUSP Radio as a volunteer. And we began to broadcast the concerts of the Cabrillo Music Festival and later the Carmel Bach Festival. And I did the, the uh, announcing on air. We did live broadcasts for many years. And I would be standing behind a, a palm tree or, or a potted plant or something doing my, my announcing for the concert. And so I have a lot of, a lot of me wonderful memories of meeting Bill there because as a radio announcer and producer and, or anyone with a microphone and you meet an artist, they're very glad to sit down and talk to you. So I, I really had a good opportunity to meet uh, both of them through that work at KUSB Radio over the years. Wonderful. Uh, Chris, how about you? Uh, how'd you end up in Santa Cruz? and? How are you connected to Lou? Well, uh, oh. you're on mute. Uh, here? There, there, you're good. Now you're good. OK. Um, I ended up in Santa Cruz for two reasons. Uh, one is there was a group of us decided to buy a farm in, uh, in Santa Cruz. It was an organic apple farm. And I moved there uh, from San, San Diego. The other reason was one of my friends from uh, Vietnam and I had decided to move to, to meet and move to uh, Santa Cruz. Um, never did find him until years later. His name was Oliver Sippel. Uh, as far as Lou, I remember seeing him and Bill play at, at, at Pride, uh, right. probably in the 80s. And um, I just saw him on the stage, the two of them were pretty unique. Uh, I moved to Viewpoint Road in 1985. And for some reason or other, I noticed someone was leaving this group of vegetables on my, on my gate every, every Saturday. And I had no idea who they were and why were they doing it. But they were great. So I decided to wait one morning. And it turned out to be Bill and Lou leaving me stuff from the farmer's market. 
I had no idea about the farmer's market. So we talked around and um, became friends. And he lived down the street from me. And I used to go visit him. And they were, they were both very unusual people. And um, Lou was probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Um, and Bill was leading people into the Sierras and going, making roads in the back of uh, Nicene Marks Park, stuff like that. Um, then we started uh, doing the over and under uh, 50s. And I would always have to borrow chairs from Lou because he had chairs, I didn't. And we'd alternate houses um, when it came our turn to do things for the over and under 40s. Um, he was um, kind of a, a role model for me as well, uh, being very active and, and very sure of himself in, for gay rights. He also had a myriad of other interests. We'd talk, it would take me a couple of weeks to figure out what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, he would do, he would talk about everything from, uh, well, you know, I think I should change my, my Mercedes from burning gas to burning uh, leftover stuff from making uh, french fries, which he did, you know, and his old car would smell like uh, french fries going down the street. He, uh, he'd talk about, I, I once made a mistake and asked him, well, you know, I think this, this um, piano at church needed tuning. I didn't know tuning was that complicated. I mean, after a while, my eyes kind of glazed over as he was talking about tuning. I really never did, did appreciate his musical side for a long while until one day he had, he had a party. He said, oh, drop by my house. We're going to have a little party. And I said, mm, okay, sure. And I, I left. And at that time, I had a dog by the name of Ariel. And she started howling. So I said, okay, I'll take Ariel. So we went. And it turned out to be something absolutely amazing. Um, Candy Beale was there. They had a stage set up. He was playing music. I mean, it was something I had never imagined to have happen on our street. And it was just one of those things that they would do that was, was absolutely uh, just mind boggling. I had never expo been exposed to that. Uh, I had never, never gone to, to the Cabrillo Music Festival. And with, because of him, I started going. Uh, and at the house party, Ariel, who was howling down at my house, was just quiet the whole time. She was like, she was just fascinated by what was going on all around us. So Bill was a really, really, Bill and Lou were, were both really good influences on me. You know, I was, I was younger at that time. They considered me the kid. And, um, <laughs> I'd go over their house. Bill was famous for making um, what he'd call garbage soup, which was really good. He'd throw all leftovers in and somehow it came out really good. And <laughs> he was the only one I ever knew that um, a bluebird actually, um, actually attached himself to him. He, he somehow identified with, with, with Bill as his mother. And when Bill would go out, he'd fly around him, go on his shoulder. I mean, it was pretty amazing. And their house was designed only for music and books. And beds, bedrooms were totally different. They were, they were sort of like afterthoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and you did puppet shows and, and gamelan, all these things I had never been exposed to. Anyway, that's partly of what my experience was with Bill who, and Lou, who were both my neighbors. Wonderful, thank you. Patrick? Well, let's see here. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. My parents brought me to Santa Cruz. Um, my family had a, a second home here. Um, I uh, settled here in 1977 after college and then uh, left again uh, to live in San Francisco for a while, came back to Santa Cruz, and uh, finally um, went off to grad school in Boston and came back in 1985 and, and settled in uh, uh, here. Uh, so let's see, the, the way that I uh, 
met Lou was through, uh, I, one year I was a co-coordinator for Gay Pride. I think it was 1979 actually. And we had a talent show as part of uh, Gay Pride. At that time, there, uh, there were almost a, an event every night of the week preceding the Gay Pride Parade. And one of them was for a talent show and it was held that year at uh, Branson 40 uh, elementary school on the corner of uh, Branson 40 and water and um, everyone was so excited about uh, that that Lou was going to be playing and and that he had brought his gamel on as well and I was like you know who is Lou Harrison and and it was like um, <laughs> the way I described it in something I wrote was that when Lou arrived it was like the parting of the waves everybody was like <gasps> you know, Lou Harrison, and, um, and they played, and I was totally, totally enraptured by his music. It was really something. I later um, ran a men's group in Santa Cruz that was kind of like a, a weekly workshop, and um, I, we decided that we wanted to, that it was mostly men in their, um, their late teens, 20s, and early 30s, and we wanted to reach out to the elder uh, gay and lesbian community, but the gay male community. And so we went to an over and under 40s potluck up in, um, uh, up, at, up on Empire Grade at Eugene Harding's house. And I made my little presentation about the group and invited people. Um, and um, lo and behold, um, you know, of that group, I, I, I re-met Lou and we started a, a friendship. Um, and he and Bill came to the uh, the the uh, men's group. A lot of the men that were in that over and under 40s group were um, hesitant to come to um, a, a group with um, younger gay men. But of course, you know, Lou and Bill did, and oh my God, they were so excited. They were, you know, delighted to meet all these people. And, and I think that uh, a number of friendships really developed out of that. Over time, um, I got to um, hang out with him on a fairly regular basis, and we, um, and I was always, always impressed with the thousand and one projects he had going at any given time, and uh, and and the incredible fountain of creativity that he was. I've never in my life met anyone who had so many different interests and the wherewithal to pursue them. You know. Um, I was able to go uh, to Joshua Tree and help him with the straw bale house. But even before that, I, it felt like I was with him for a year and a half of, of all this testing for uh, 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 structural integrity that was going on up at UC Berkeley to establish his straw bale house. Um, we'd go to concerts. We did lots of different things together. Um, uh, he always, always had something new to tell you about. Oh, and by the way, not only was he connected to Portland, uh, he also lived in Oakland. And at some point he lived in Stockton, which we had in common. And I will never forget, he, he described Stockton as the Paris of the Great Central Valley. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, um, so we had a little of that in common as well. Great, thank you. Um, so the, the next question um, I'm curious about is, is to have you all talk a little bit about who Larry, Lou Harrison was, what brought him to Santa Cruz, and, and how he was connected to the LGBTQ community. Um, and I think to get us going with that, we're gonna play a little clip from Bill describing Lou. Scamalana, all the upper tones are uh, conduit pipe pieces. And for good reason, I was an electrician when I met Lou Harrison, I had been working in San Francisco for many, many years, about 20 as an electrician, but uh, my main interest was music all the time. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know what I was ever going to get into music or not, because electrician was a good living after all. And I met this character that was making instruments out of brake drums and, uh, I mean, using as it was brake drums and pieces of pipe and one thing or another. And, and he's doing all these interesting things. And I was tired of working in San Francisco, so I moved out with him and to his little cabin-like house in Aptos. So um, th that kind of gets us going. I'm 
curious um, who would like to jump in and talk a little bit about more about Lou and Santa Cruz. Well, I, I was. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be on with talking that um, uh, part of my problem in this is the fact that I was put up. Sorry about that. That's oh. for our next clip. So let's have the, some live person talk first. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. That was a it's funny. Uh, that, Go ahead, uh, Tom. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that Patrick mentioned uh, the 79 uh, Pride and the uh, Lou performing at the, I was at that and it, I, I too had that same experience with, and you know, it was it was such an amazing time in Santa Cruz. I think the those the, the mid seventies mm -hmm. and going up for maybe a couple of decades. And uh, I think Lou's contribution to the community was gracious, natural, and um, unassuming. I mean, he had that kind of a personality that it made it, it was, it was uh, pretty wonderful. Another encounter I had with Lou was, was because I was singing with the Cabrillo Symphonic Chorus, which is part of Cabrillo College. And uh, we performed uh, Lou Harrison's La Cor Sutro, La Cor Sutro uh, at the Pasadena, uh, what is it, the um, Western edition of the American Choral Director Society. Uh, convention, and uh, we with this is this uh, gamelan that uh, Bill and Blue had made, but Bill had really designed, and uh, it was shipped all the way down to Pasadena, and it was amazing just the assembly of it, and uh, we all performed it off book, and it was performed in Esperanto, which is a language that uh, Lou was an incredible promoter of, uh, because it was being a passive himself it was sort of the internet the I conceived as the international language for a new world post World War II and uh, it, it was uh, so it was wonderful we sang it off book so everyone had memorized it and uh, it was quite and Lou and Bill were there and you know Lou's expression of anticipation in the audience he would, of course he was standing off to the side and not sitting down was that of uh, joy pleasure and you know it was almost like a kid in a candy shop you know i i don't know how else to put it but it was it was it was joyous uh and it was an amazing performance it was a, a really stunned a lot of people uh, do, because it was so different than anything which usually gets produced do any of you know why why lou came to santa cruz to begin with what brought him here and what caused him to stay only, only what i've read for me that's what i'll, I'll end with that uh-huh yeah, I, yeah, and I, I could, I we could talk been, about it. I think he'd been teaching back east. Um, oh, at uh, Black Mountain. Mountain. And or that, he was in New right. York City. Yeah. And he wasn't doing very well. I think he, um, he had some emotional difficulties. He actually had an emotional breakdown, I believe. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's when he left the east and came, came back to California. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. It's always interesting to know what, what causes people to discover Santa Cruz. Go ahead, Chris. What? Uh oh, you're muted. You're muted. The mute. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Can you hear me? Go, Chris. He just turned himself off again. Ah. Oh, okay. Chris. Chris, you're muted. Ah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I really don't know why uh, Lou moved here, but I do know that um, he had a, a major impact on, on the community, mm -hmm. uh, the gay community. Uh, his approach to, to gay rights as well as far as music was very um, calm, cool, collected, more like, yeah, we, we deserve these rights. We're Americans. And so one of the things that happened was that uh, Jerry Solomon and I actually started um, a gay, um, we were the first gay uh, therapist. And we had this uh, group called the, the, um, the on, on Seabright, the Seabright Therapy Clinic, where one of our other people here uh, was part of too. And that was the first of Santa Cruz. And I, I think that comes a lot from, uh, from what Lou was doing. 
if I could add to that, the, the things that people are saying about the way that he was uh, unassuming about uh, gay rights, uh, it was um, as if he was, uh, you know, a hundred steps ahead of us in, in the evolution of uh, his own understanding of being gay. Um, he had been very open throughout his life, but it was an integrated part of who he was. So he had this um, amazing uh, uh, community of friends. He, he was constantly gathering new friends and always had great stories about, you know, some adventure they had been on or whatever. And, and as Tom and both Chris said, it, it, was, it was a subtle thing. It was more just a part of well, it's just a part of life, you know, that, that he and, and Bill had this relationship and they, and uh, that, uh, and in their presence in the community, at times they did appear um, around political activities, but um, it wasn't like he had already been through all of that angst and um, uh, struggle around being gay. And it just was part of who he was. And, you know, he it, it was just part of life just like the gamelan was and the opera and the you know you could go on and on and on there was esperanto there were pickled nasturtium seeds there were you know the garbage soup it was all of that going on and so his his influence in the gay community was subtle but very very uh profound um, oh and if i can show you this uh here's one of the things that lou did he um created uh, fonts for um, uh, computers at one point while he was also, I believe, working on Young Caesar at the time, the opera. Young Caesar was an ongoing project for quite a long time, but here's the Chora Sutro uh, done in his font, uh, which is just another example of, you know, bits and pieces he was doing. I was teaching at Cabrillo, he was teaching at Cabrillo, and the unusual thing was that he held his classes in uh, the gamelan room, the music room at his house. And it was a, a big, um, it, it was like a, a very, very large open room, almost warehouse-like, that had uh, uh, subterranean heat and um, all these musical instruments everywhere. Um, and it was where they would practice uh, and hold classes. It was really, really something. Esalie, did you want to add something to this? I saw your comment in the chat. I just wanted to say that I had heard of Lou before I sang La Coro Sutro with him down in Pasadena. And what I'd heard of him before La Coro Sutro, I really enjoyed. So that's what I have to say. Great, thank you. Um, well, let's hear, any, anybody else? Yeah, I, I think um, everything you've said about Lou is so reminiscent and I, I don't have the experience of having countless meetings with him, but when I went to his house, Bill was always there, in fact, Bill and Lou seemed to be together all the time. You didn't see Lou, I didn't hardly see him without Bill along. And uh, Bill was a bit amorous, to say the least, when I'd visit. Uh, I don't know if anybody else had that experience, but I always uh, felt flattered by that. And, uh, and uh, so I wanted to read a little poem that um, Lou wrote to Bill from his book, um, joys and perplexities, and I might talk about this book later, but I think his font is in here, and so also he has drawings like this nude, so he is also quite an artist. Um, anyway, the, the poem is, uh, there's several in this book. This one's just called Of Bill, and it's, to have any intimacy with this man is a rarely wondrous thing, jeweled and shimmering, and upon at once altar and the blackest, blackest mass. I myself do not know if I have shared anything with him, but my friends have said, quote, this man is special. Be careful, he's rare. And one has said, quote, he is the best decision you have made in 23 years. 
And I don't know how many years there they were together. Also, the book mm-hmm. written, the bio written about him, Tom probably knows the name, would probably answer maybe a lot of questions about the timing of events. What was her name? Um, Ava? From, oh. No, the, the book, the author of the biography of Lou. Oh, right. Um, Lita. 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 Right. Yeah. right. There you go, Roger. Yeah. Yeah. A book worth reading for the most part. So let's yeah, hear, uh, let's hear a little bit from um, Lou himself. So, Roger, you want to cue up that next part? He was asked uh, on a on a panel discussion what his image uh, when he was growing up, what his image of manhood was. Uh, part of my problem in this is the fact that I was put on the stage by mother when I was two and a half. And in some sense, I've never gotten off stage. And the the ability to please an audience was part of growing up and being adult, because I was surrounded by adults on the stage, of course, and also in, in the life. I was a part of a touring com- company. But as I grew up, the um, image of manhood, I think, became people like Henry Cowell and Charles Ives and other composers who were um, uh, prominent in the world of music. And uh, I gravitated towards those people. Um, the personal relationships were with other men were peer group, uh, but the image of, of uh, virile attainment was a famous artist for example, and those were dominantly musicians. When I look back on it, I, I had, in fact, really wanted to be a painter, but somehow I got elected in music, so that's what it amounts to. And, and then, go ahead, Roger, for the next, next part. Uh, the, other, the other one I have is, um, when, he's, when he was asked about gay rights, and was he um, impressed by or electrified by Stonewall? Ruin Bill, Stonewall in the 60s. Did that electrify yeah. you? No. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because we'd done that in San Francisco 10 years before without the rumpus. New York likes to advertise itself. But for example, the Society for Individual Rights in San Francisco, which both Bill and I were members, uh, felt that the proper or one of the proper approaches to this problem of gay rights was simply uh, organizing and inviting all who stood for office to come and to talk with us and say, what are you going to do, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Bill and I have talked with Hongisto, with uh, uh, Feinstein and we heard, talk, and Willie Brown and Willie Brown swore in front of us that he would not stop until the laws in California were changed and he didn't what's more so we approached this politically whereas of course in New York it was a riot and a lot of publicity uh, sure it helped out there but that's quite different from the 10 year previous uh, experience here in which we uh, did it politically so our, our fight for civil rights was uh, done at a political level from the beginning out here. The- any reaction to any of those quotes from anybody? Well, there was always that, uh, that uh, how would you say, a diffidence about uh, the New Yorkers and their way of being. That was very true. <laughs> um, and, um, and he was uh, very, kind of surprised that there would be all this, as he put it, rumpus about um, gay rights because he felt like they had already, you know, opened the door. Yeah, and it's wonderful to hear him in a, such a matter of fact way about his approach. And I think it's, it's so typical of Lou to uh, just say, but we just did it. <laughs> you know, it, just, it was his style, you know. Yeah. His, his um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. His, his approach of doing it politically by talking to leaders really uh, took hold in Santa Cruz, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. For instance, we had John Laird, who ended up being one of our political leaders. And I remember talking with a number of folks about stuff like gay rights and stuff. So it was... Um, it, it was it was different from New York. We didn't have a riot, um, and I think it was gradual, but but um, political, more political than um, than it it 
it, it was a good thing rather than, and I think a lot of it was from Lou Harrison's influence. I, I think it's important, however, to not make too much of a difference between San Francisco and New York when we think about, you know, what happened here with um, the assassination of of Harvey Milk and George Moscone and the White Knight riots that, you know, there was a lot of po political activity out in the streets itself. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just a kind of a more clean political process. So I'm curious, um, and maybe um, Chris, I'll have you start with this one. Um, talk a little bit about Lou's long term impact on you or on the Santa Cruz community or the LGBTQ community, any aspect of that. Let's talk a little bit about his, his long range impact on all of us. So Chris, why don't you start with that one? Well, I think the, um, as I said before, I think the initial, oh, uh, um, the initial impact was seeing someone who was older and very uh, comfortable with being gay and in basically saying we deserve as many rights as any other American. And I think that went out into the community uh, as it certainly affected me and the way I, I dealt with it. Um, as I said before, we, we started a um, TLTB um, gay therapy group. Um, I came out uh, in the 70s and um, in, in general, I think the long term has been to uh, basically go along with what he's thinking. Yeah, this is part of me and it's okay, it's healthy, and um, I deserve the same rights as you do as an American. So I think it made a very long term uh, impact on me and on the Santa Cruz community. We now have a, a diversity center. <laughs> And that's very unusual for, for a lot of, a lot of uh, small towns don't have this. So I, th I think part of what he did was activate our community in a positive way. And, and yes, I do, remember, I do remember the White Knights at, at, uh, when Moscone and, and, uh, was killed and, and, and Harvey Milk was, was assassinated, yeah. Uh, but in general, it, um, it's, it's been a slow, steady movement towards uh, equality. And years ago, I remember talking about, well, how about gay marriage? And the feeling was not, we'll never get there. And yet we've gotten there. So some of the seeds he's, he so, sowed here and nationwide maybe has taken hold. Tom, you want to add on to that? You know, uh, well, I think that um, Lou's humility has made, in, a, in a way, has made him a, an icon for many people. But at the same time, he was, he, he was not a, a big, um, loud, expressive person to, to promote his things, even though he did. It was, it was a very soft approach. And... I, the dynamics of this man, which are so uh, broad in Renaissance in nature, that uh, I think it's it almost it, it's hard to imagine for many people the impact that he has had. Actually, that we're not even conscious of it in a sense. Uh, but I think if if for those people who do delve into uh, Lou Harrison's life and his music in particular. Is there? Uh, there's this incredible opportunity to um, to see this 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 amazing queer spirit, this beautiful, gorgeous queer spirit that lived on this planet, that we were so fortunate that he did chose to move to Aptos because he wanted a little greenery and sweet country life, because you know the the city just became too much for him and that's basically what it was he didn't appreciate that he really wanted a more organic structure and, and his life was very much in that sense from then on so i i'm hoping with these uh webinar this this webinar in particular that uh the our, our queer community uh will more will embrace 
uh, Lou Harrison and be more cognizant of what he has done. And I think in general, this is yet to be a story yet to be played uh, that uh, in, it, I think it'll be future generations will come more likely come to fully appreciate the impact of Lou Harrison and who he was because he was so much on, on so many levels. He's a, a Renaissance man and brilliant. Just like, you know, I think Chris has talked, to, talked about his, his the conversations that he would have, they would take him days to, to digest and understand. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think we've all had that kind of experience with Lou at some level who had a chance to uh, connect with him. And so, yeah. It's, it's Great. Great. Roger, you want to talk a little bit about the, his impact and perhaps why he stayed in Santa Cruz, how Santa Cruz impacted him, how he impacted Santa Cruz and the broader community? Well, I think Tom, Tom put it very well, um, mm -hmm. explained it very well. Beyond the influence that he had, the great influence that he had on the local LGBTQ uh, community, his influence was tremendous for the entire Santa Cruz community as a whole mm -hmm. and beyond. You know, uh, not only did the Cabrillo Festival play a lot of his music, but Dennis Russell Davies, who was a music director for several years, became a real champion of Lou's music. Um, and not only here in Santa Cruz, but he took it around the world. He took it back east. He took it to Europe. Um, so the people really got to know Lou well. But I think the local community, the local concert going community here at Cabrillo Festival were exposed quite a bit to Lou and Bill and the music. And I think just mm -hmm. having them as role models of, of a gay couple, for example, was very helpful to the whole community to see here is a, this is what, this is what two men can do, can live like. And so it was because it was not a revolutionary thing for them. It was just the way they lived. I think that had, that had a, an influence on the greater community here in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. Patrick? Well, I can't help but agree with everything um, folks have said. The, the greater impact that he had on the larger community in Santa Cruz by just being himself, by just being uh, with Bill, um, uh, really affected a lot of people. They saw um, this, uh, they saw being gay as something that was just a part of life. And it was just a part of who he was. Um, and, and I think it did have a much larger impact on um, just all the pe the concert goers and the uh, the people involved in interested in music and the people interested in sign language or um, you know or learning gamelan or what have you, it just uh, had reverberations throughout the community. And do you know why he why he uh, learned sign language? Does anyone well, know that? Lou was um, always interested in communication right. and um, he found, um, like with the Esper uh, es Esperanto, um, he, um, as uh, Bill was getting older, he was losing his uh, hearing and Lou wanted to make sure that uh, he could communicate with Bill. Right. Uh, right. So then he took that one on. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to add into the impact of, of Lou to the community, either local is, or broadly? This is Larry here. I'll jump in if you don't mind. Yeah, um, great. Uh, so I lived at Eugene Harding's house on Empire Grade Road when Gene started doing the uh, hosting the over 40s potluck. And I remember Lou and Bill coming up to the house uh, a number of times. I was only, I only lived up there about a year, not even. Uh, but they were they were so hippie like, matter of fact, um, lo loving with each other. And uh, in one of the clips that Roger played, I heard Lou's laugh. Lou had a really unique, jovial laugh. Um, but I also remember. Um, before I got together with my husband, Tom, um, crossing paths with Lou and Bill, because I was part, of, along with Dan and David, who were on this call, we were all part of that first gay pride. And I don't remember who invited Lou and Bill to be um, performers, but they performed in 1975 for our fledgling first 
Happy Pride, and then they performed again a couple of years later. Uh, and I also remember um, going up to their house for the over 40s potlucks with the famous uh, soup, the perpetual vegetarian soup that went on, was kept going for years. Uh, and I remember with Tom, my husband, going to house concerts at, at Lou's house where magic was happening in that performance space, storage of the gamelan and all the other instruments that were there. It was, and puppet shows. I mean, there was magic that happened uh, up there. And, and lastly, I'd like to say that um, as Bill failed in his health, and I believe he broke his hip, um, I was a social worker at Watsonville Hospital at that time. Bill was in the hospital. Bill came home uh, to their house in Aptos. I was the social worker for their, the visiting nurses service that Watsonville Hospital had. And I was there, uh, unfortunately, as, as Bill continued to decline. And um, I was there a lot for Lou at that time as Bill basically passed on. So um, he had, there was a lot of connection there. That's it. Anybody else want to add in? Any final thoughts about Lou before we uh, finish up with some of his music? I think we're all a little bit overwhelmed with who he was and in trying to uh, express that, uh, what can we say? <laughs> you know, he was a renaissance man and a constant source of creativity be it uh, music or anything else. Just one other little thing is when uh, Lou was asked towards the end of his life, so what do you make of your life? How do you want to be remembered? And he said, uh, oh, just I want to be remembered as Lou Harrison is an old man who had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. just, rather than say for my music or, you know, it just it was just this, uh, sage-like, you know, uh, approach to way of thinking of what life is and things like that. I just think it was so special about him. Mm -hmm. No, the, uh, towards the end of his, not towards the end of his life, but back in, during the Cabrillo Festival years, um, there was a time when his music had the largest number of recordings in the, in the, then the record catalog of the time. So he was being, he was being, um, his music was getting out there more than any other contemporary composer at the time. And I think a lot of that had to do with Dennis Russell Davies um, and his, his efforts. Um, but that's, his, his fame just went, went out from there. And yet he, he got tired of writing music. He didn't, he had so many commissions for concertos, for symphonies, and he was getting so weary of that. He really preferred to work with Gamelan. And he said, all writing music for him on, with a pen and, and, and pen and paper, he said, was like putting so many fly specks on the paper. And he was just <laughs> sick of that. He didn't want to do that anymore. And um, he wrote a symphony he called, this is, he called it the last symphony, not symphony number this or that, the last symphony. So I asked him one day, I said, well, what happens if you decide to write another one? Oh, then I'll just call it my next to last symphony. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, a f final comment from you. Uh, yeah, let's see if I can unmute here. You're unmuted. Oops, now you're muted. <laughs> now yeah. you're good, now All you're right. good. Uh, he, Lou made a real major impact on me, even when I go past his, where his house was. I, I walk the dog, my dogs, twice a day, go back by his house, I always think of him because he turned me on to so many things. Um, music, uh, I, I had no idea of Gamelon, I had no idea of some of the music he was creating until I met him uh, and just opened my eyes to lots of things in the world to not um, just be stagnant, to just try to live life and explore everything you can. And I think that's one of his greatest uh, gifts that he gave me. Wonderful. A anybody else want to add in before we uh, hear some of his music to finish this I, out? 
I, I remember him being a good hugger. Um, and also just some standout events. I remember one of his birthday parties certainly wasn't his 50th up at UC in the performance hall was a big deal with a huge cake that really is a standout. And then also he collaborated with so many people that we could not possibly cover here in the field of music and, and dance. dance. I remember he and Mark Morris, the dancer who's still alive, had a, a lot of work they did together. And when Mark Morris was the artistic director at the Ojai Music Festival a number of years ago, he made sure that Lou's music was played there. And I, I misremember that as kind of a great way to get in touch again, because we went down there for the whole for the whole series. And, uh, and so it's just really, and there's a lot of references in Mark's uh, autobiography to Lou also, if you get that book. Anyway, I just remember that, oh, that I just never felt like he forgot who I was. And I didn't see him very often, not as much, but it wasn't like he'd walk by him and he wouldn't know who you were. You know, we weren't best buddies or anything, but, you know, certainly was one of those people that just had this amazing capacity to, to just hold on to anything like a friendship. Great. Anything else? Anybody? Sure. Hi there. Hi. Hey. All right, Tom. <laughs> Tom, please speak to us. <laughs> sure. I um, I'm Tom Fredericks, and I was at the Cabrillo Festival of Contemporary Music from 1991 through 2012, and in that span of time in the 90s. Um, along with music director and conductor Marin Alsup, we produced um, Lou Harris, some of Lou Harrison's symphony and an opera. And it was an opera that I never forgot the experience of. It was a Rapunzel, yep. small cast, one act, maybe two acts, not a full evening. And Sanford Sylvan was the um, baritone tenor. I think his range went to tenor. I'm not sure about that part because I don't know anything about music. That was the great thing about all of this. Um, <laughs> but uh, Marin did it as a gift to Lou. Um, and it was a stretch for the festival to do it because it involved producing the opera, you know, sets and costumes, lighting the whole thing. And uh, Lou was there for rehearsals. And we were all very nervous because we wanted it to be really good and he sat down at that first rehearsal and I kept my eye on him because that was my job. I had to be ready to do whatever needed to be done. And oh my God, it was like, as soon as the orchestra started and the singing began, even in rehearsal, he was totally in love with listening to his music. Mm. It didn't even have to be polished yet. And then that went on to the performance that never let up. Tom Ellison referred to this earlier on. You know, I've, in those years at Cabrillo Festival, I, I worked with, you know, who knows, 70, 80 composers in residence at the festival. And they're always nervous. They're always afraid. It's, is it going well? Is the performance gonna be good? Not never do you see a composer sit down in front of the first rehearsal and not being able to hear it performed. And that has always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he did that, how he could just enjoy his work. So that's my, that's my final thought. Thank you. Wonderful. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anybody else's final thoughts before uh, Roger has a final story and some music for us? All right, Roger, you're on. You know, he was so interested in Gamelan, he wrote music for Gamelan a lot. And there was a, a concert back probably the 1980s, I think, at, up here at Peace United Church uh, in Santa Cruz of his Gamelan group. And he appeared as the soloist in one of the pieces that he had written. And it was for this little tiny Javanese flute called the Su Ling. I was, again, announcing live with my microphone just before the concert, and I was right around the corner from the a little barrier behind 
Lou. I didn't realize I was so close to him. At one point I looked around the corner and there was, there was this huge man sitting on a cushion with this little tiny flute. And as, as you'll hear in this recording, that sound, especially in Peace United, you know, which is such live acoustics, that sound just soared through that entire interior. And I was just spellbound by this music and it had so much joy in it. And yet it was so peaceful and very strong all at the same time. It had all of those characteristics at the same time because of the way he was playing. And I think you'll agree when you hear this.